Good morning again. John chapter 7, if you'd like to open up your Bibles there, if you got your phone or however you do it, if you don't have a Bible, please grab a Bible in the seat in front of you. And if you don't have one at home even, grab that Bible, take it home. It's our gift to you. All right? So I want us all in God's Word today. But before I get into that, I just... I want to say, you know, I am so thankful, and I know I say it a lot, but I want you guys to know it. I'm so thankful to be your pastor, so thankful to be uh, walking this journey with you. D- the other day, uh, it was yesterday, Heather and I, uh, we were talking about going to Cottonwood, and she's like, well, I mean, maybe I'll go by myself, or do you want to come? And I'm like, well, you know, it's easier when you go by yourself, because then you don't have to stress about me thinking, okay, are we done at this store yet? Are we... You know, like, what's going on? And she goes, no, come with me. So I said, all right. So I went with her, and um, we walked into Walmart, right? And and I've told you, man, Walmart can be a mission field, right, all in itself. And we we walk into Walmart, and I see somebody we know, so I go over, and I talk to them. And then we see another person I know, and we go over, and we talk to them. And and it was, they're... Their daughter was going through something, so we saw them right there at the checkout stand, so we just circled up right there in the checkout stand, and we started praying for one another, and and it was awesome. And then we walk away, and they said, thank you, or what have you, and we walked away, and Heather goes, yeah, maybe I should have came by myself. (laughs) It's quicker without you, you know? But it's so fun. I just love walking life with you guys. And, you know, each week I get to call new people or people that from last week rededicated their life. And it's so awesome. I thank you guys. And thank you guys so much for engaging in the love of Jesus to really like welcoming people when they walk through these doors and encouraging one another and, and, and living life together. So thank you. It, it is such a joy of mine. So Let me pray, and then we'll get into this, all right? Father, I thank you for your love, for your grace. I thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray that you would speak to us, that you would show us, again, more and more of yourself. And then, Lord, we would walk away thinking, contemplating, what does this mean for me And Lord, what are you calling me to do? How are you calling me to trust you? How are you calling me to look at the situations that I'm facing in a way that brings honor and glory to you? In Jesus' name, amen. So we're going to get into chapter 7 here in just a little bit, but I want to give a little bit of backstory. Chapter 6, about halfway through chapter 6, Jesus reaches his pinnacle of what we would call worldly success or fame. He has all these followers. He had just fed, and we know the scripture says 5,000, but we know it was so many more. And he has all these people that are just following him, per se, these fans. And so he reaches this pinnacle of fame, and all these people are excited about what he's doing. And then Jesus gives this hard truth about his death and and how that if we are to have life, we are to eat of him and, and, and drink of him. And so many people started to fall away and leave, as Pastor Jim talked about last weekend, and he said, you know, are you a fan or are you a follower? And so then that is the backdrop to where we get in to chapter 7. So let's go ahead and read. We're going to read uh, verses 1 to 13. Chapter 7, verses 1 to 13. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go up to Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now the Jews feast of the booth was at hand. So his brother said to him, leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world, for not, for not even his brothers believed in him. Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come. But your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. You go up to the feast. I am not going to go up to the feast, for my time has not fully come. 
After saying this, he remained in Galilee. Verse 10. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said, he is a good man, others said, no, he is leading the people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke to him openly of him time time is one of those things that can seem to drag on or fly by i've heard this saying that the days are long but the years are short you guys heard that saying so it's and and time is something that when things aren't going your way you wish you could speed up time. Or when you want a certain thing to happen, say you're praying for a loved one or you're facing something very challenging in your life, you want time to speed up. But when times are going well or when they're sweet, you want time to slow down. And time is one of those things which, in reality, we don't have control over a lot of things. Let's just be real. But time, for sure, is one of those things that we cannot stop or we cannot control. But as I said earlier, time is one of, it's like the day is long, but the years are short. And I remember, it made me think of this when I read that saying, the first time that I was left alone with our oldest daughter, Shay. Um, she was probably two weeks old at the time. Heather m needed to watch me and make sure it was okay to leave the house up to that point, and she figured it was okay. So anyway, so our daughter is sleeping, and Heather had just made a meal, and we realized that we were out of tortillas, <laughs> which is like a tragedy in our house, and so it was like an emergency, and so Heather's like, well, I'll run to the store. And I said, okay, I said, I want you to get out. You haven't gotten out much. Shay has been here, you know, that's our oldest daughter. You get out and go to the store. And she's like, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I want you to go. Well, Heather proceeded to get ready. By that time, though, Shay had now woken up. And Shay was breastfed, like all of our kids. And Heather's like, well, then I shouldn't go. You just run. I said, no, 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 I want you to get out. Go, go, get, go out to the store. And so she goes Shay cried the whole time, our daughter. It felt like an eternity. Uh, she must have been gone for years, really. I'm thinking, how hard is it to find tortillas and go to the cash register? It's not that hard. The day was long during that situation. But this, just a couple weeks ago, we celebrated our daughter's 30 second birthday okay we can clap for her if you're watching Che, that's for you anyways and now i look back and i think where has the time gone it's gone so fast where is it what has happened now she's 32 years old man I, i'm getting old we have two kids in their 30s now and, and I was just thinking about, I remember when they're young, but sometimes when you're faced with that parenting and that struggle and all these things, you're like, man, will this ever end? But then when you look back, you're like, oh my gosh, that's all that time is gone. Here's the thing. In this text today, we're going to see that God works on his own time frame, his own time frame. And for some of us, including me, that's not always great. When I want something, I want it when? Yeah. Yesterday. I was waiting for you guys all to say now, but yesterday. That's how impatient I am. Be, I'm being honest with you guys. When I want something, I want it yesterday. Like, what's going on, God? Where are you? You know, I've waited for 30 seconds. Why didn't it happen yet? What's going on? You know, I've been praying for this family member to come back to you, or I've been praying for this situation with my child, or I've been praying for the situation in my marriage. God, what is going on? But you see, God works on his own time frame in his own way. 
And we have to remember that. And sometimes that's challenging. For those that like to be in control, that is challenging. That is hard. And we see here in our text, let's, let's go back through it and I'll show you how to handle those times when God is not working in our time frame. Listen to verse 1. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go up to Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. So after this time, we have to recognize here that at the beginning of chapter 6, it says that the Passover was near. Verse 2, we're going to see that the Feast of Booths is happening So in that time frame, there's six months that has passed. So within this six months, Jesus is just hanging out in Galilee. I'm sure he's doing stuff. I'm sure he's teaching. I'm sure he's ministering. But he's hanging out in Galilee. Why? Because it says that the Jews were seeking to kill him. Now look at verse 2. Now the Jews, the Feast of the Booths, was at hand. What is the Feast of the Booths? What is that? And and I love it in our reading plan. I want to encourage you. If you're in the reading plan, keep going, because this is the time that we're like, man, we're halfway through the year. Do I really have to keep going? Yes, keep going. Keep pressing in. You've made it through Leviticus. You can keep going, right? So keep going. And so here we are in Deuteronomy. Where what we're seeing is the faithfulness of God throughout the 40 years in the wilderness and how God, it said today that their their clothes did not even wear out. How awesome would that be? Wouldn't that be really cool? They don't make clothes that way anymore, do they? You know, I, I'm not going to tell that story. But anyways, there were just times where I tell you my clothes have failed and they were in, in, in not appropriate times. But the clothing, all right, their clothing didn't even wear out, it says. And then here we are, the feast of the, the booths is you go from your house, because now they're in the promised land, you go, in your ha- you go from your house and you sleep in tents. What's that called for us today? Camping. camping. So for them, when they would say, we're going to go camping at this time, right after the harvest, they've worked really hard, now they're going to go camping. They're not just going to go camping to have s'mores, though. They're going to go for a purpose. Their purpose in going camping was to remember the faithfulness and the provision of God when they didn't have their home. That's what they're going. That's what's happening right now. So they're all living in tents, and people are going up to Jerusalem. Look at verse 3 and 4. So his brothers said to him, leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do the things, show, if you do these things, show yourself to the world. So his brothers are not saying a bad thing. They're, they're, they're speaking truth. Jesus says in the, the, um, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, he says that we are the light of the world. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a table. Shine your light. So they're telling him, hey, if you really who you are, you should go up there because there's going to be lots of people. This is like a photo op for your, your profession. Go up. Everybody will see you. You show them who you are. So they're not, they're not speaking a lie, but I think they could be a little bit sarcastic. Do you think? Do you think they could just be goading him? Think about what just happened to him. Again, in chapter 6, what happens? A lot of people fall away. They're saying, if you're really who you are, go and more, you will gain more disciples. But Jesus does not. He says, I will not go. But listen to verse 5, and you need, you need to remember this. You need to remember this. It says in verse 5, for not even his brother's believed in him remember that we're going to get back to that but could you imagine just for a second if you've had siblings think back to your time with your sibling could you imagine being the brother of jesus 
Think about that. Think about that growing up as a child in the same household as Jesus. Did anybody ever here get in trouble for doing something or breaking something in their house? Getting in a fight with your sibling? Remember those days, right? If you're still doing it, stop it. But remember those days. Do you think Mary ever walked into the room after she hears a big crash and then said, Jesus, what are you doing? She probably honestly said, James, what did you just do? Why? Because it was Jesus. Jesus could never be in trouble. Think about that. He went through life without what? Sinning. So I I couldn't imagine. I think, man, I would run and hide because I would be the one that always got in trouble if I was Jesus' brother. It would be my fault. And you know what's crazy is when I grew up with my siblings, I have two older sisters and then a younger brother. But when I grew up, when I was born, actually, excuse me, they didn't think I was going to live past six months. Um, I had what you called a gabaglobian deficiency. That's a big word. Does anybody know what that means? Okay, some of us do. I had an issue with white blood cells. Um, My white blood cells would not reproduce. So if I ever got an infection, then I could have a real chance of dying. So I lived as kind of like the child in a bubble. You ever seen that movie, there was a boy in the bubble or whatever, where they were always afraid that he would get sick? Well, that's how I lived. So my mom was very, very protective of me. And even to this day, pray for me. But anyway, she, she was, she was super protective. And I learned at a very, very young age that my sisters couldn't do anything to me. <laughs> Seriously. It was never my fault. I would walk up behind them and I'd hit them in the back of the head. And they couldn't do anything to me. And I go, na 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 na. Seriously, you can ask my mom if you meet her one day. Until the day that it stopped was I got a little older. I kept antagonizing my sisters, which I know is totally against my personality. But anyways, (laughs) my sister was about to shove my head through the wall. She was running with my head like this towards a wall. My mom (laughs) stopped her. Thank you, Jesus. But my mom stopped her. Could you again, could you imagine growing up with Jesus? He could never do no wrong. It was always your fault. And so here's his brothers, and we even have a story like this in Scripture. We have Joseph and his brothers, right? Joseph was that chosen child that he could do no wrong in his father's eyes. Here we have something very similar. Where Jesus' brothers, yes, they were speaking truth, but they were doing it as like, okay, if you are who you really are, go do something. It was very sarcastic. It was very like, yeah, sure, whatever. Can you imagine, though, growing up in a house and missing the Savior right in front of you? That would be hard. But let's let's continue. He says in verse 6, because they say, go up, and this is how he answers them. Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always here. See, Jesus, again, works on his time frame. He says he works on a divine time frame, but he says something that is super important. He says, your time is always here. Your time is always here. So what's the difference between Jesus' time and And then now our time, because I believe we're on a schedule as well that God purposed for our lives. But what's the difference? Jesus was sent to what? Die, be crucified, and be resurrected for the forgiveness of our sins. That was his purpose. Jesus saying, it's not my time to go do this. But we as people just being born, our number one purpose is to have a relationship with Jesus. Our time is always here for that. Their time was always there. Now is the day. Not tomorrow. Now is the time. And why did John write this verse, remember? Excuse me, this book? Right here. Because listen, this is what it talks about, right? Let's go ahead and put that on there. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and by believing in him, you may have life. Here's the thing. Yes, Jesus' time had not fully come, but our time is right now. If you don't know 
Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, now is your time. And they didn't. Verse 5 even said, they did not know. And then we continue in verse 6. He says, excuse me, 7, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. Could we say that's the same thing that's going on today? Could we say that the works of the world are evil today? Yes, they are, unfortunately. How do we live in that? How do we navigate this culture? Here's the thing. Jesus was hated, excuse me, because he testified that their works were evil. He didn't go around slamming people that they were evil. You see the difference there? Do we go around slamming people? Or do we recognize the works that they're doing are bad? See, if somebody's going to hate me, I want them to hate me because I stand on the truth, not on my preference, not on the way I judge somebody, but on God's word. When I approach somebody, it's with grace and truth. So here... What do we learn from this whole interaction? And I've said it several times today, but Jesus will not be hurried because he works on a divine schedule. Jesus will not be hurried or manipulated into doing something out of the Father's will and time. Now, I get that that can be very challenging sometimes to hear. Because then we have to, when we've been praying for that loved one, to come back to the Lord. When we've been praying for that loved one who is suffering with whatever illness, do I trust that God is working on his time frame? Or do I try to make things happen in my own time frame? Do I try, well, if I just pray harder, if I do this, if I do that, Whatever they are, can I then hurry Jesus up or can I manipulate him into doing something outside of his timing and his will? The answer is a big fat no. We cannot. But then what do we do? What do we do? How do we go through this life? Because, again, we can be praying for things that are in God's will, I believe that God wants everybody to be saved. Amen? Scripture says that. I believe that God wants my children to walk with him. So what do I do when the time frame doesn't seem to come in my time frame? I trust the Lord. I trust him. And I recognize that, listen, this is is important. God is outside of time. Do we believe that? He existed before time, and he's going to continue to exist for eternity. He is outside of, we are confined in a certain amount of time and a space. Look, think about it this way, and I know all analogies aren't perfect, but think about it this way. Heather and I went on a hike the other day, and we're hiking, and we're hiking in this valley. And we're looking up at the mountains and we're saying, oh, man, they are so pretty. They are so beautiful. Then we turn on the trail and we start doing these switchbacks going up this other mountain. We stop halfway because I'm out of breath. We stop and we look. And what do we see? A beautiful view, right? It just got more beautiful up a little bit higher. Then we go up a little bit higher and we get to the top. And what do we do? We look out and we're like, wow, in awe. We can see all of this. That's kind of how God is. We are confined to this time, yet God can see it all. God sees it all. And and it's even like this. When you watch a movie, we can only watch it frame by frame, right? God sees the movie as one. He sees our life as one scene. And he says, I know what's in front. I know what's coming up. Keep trusting me. Keep praying for that loved one. But trust me, I know the time because I am outside of time. 
So let's keep trusting him. Here's the thing. I told you to remember verse 5 because it says, and I, and I want to encourage you, because listen, there was a time in my life when I was ready to walk away from the faith. And I had my kids and my wife encouraging me. No, you know, my kids would say, no, Dad, you know God is faithful. You know that he walks every step with you. The same thing, Heather would say the same thing. Now I'm in a time where some of my kids are not walking with the Lord. And that breaks my heart. And I don't like it. And so I'm in this time frame of, God, why? Verse 5, it says, even his brothers did not believe. Do you know, after the resurrection, when they saw who Jesus really was, when the Father drew them, as we talked about in chapter 6, they became pillars in the church. James, his half-brother, wrote the book of James. Jude, his other unbelieving brother, came to him and surrendered his life and wrote the book of Jude, another half-brother. You could be sitting here thinking, why doesn't that family member trust the Lord right now? Let's trust God's timing. Don't lose hope. Because here's the thing. Jesus lived with these guys, and these guys missed it until their time was right. So I hope that encourages you if you're struggling with a family member, that God's timing is right. I got to get through this because we're running out of time. <laughs> Look at verse 10. But after his brothers had gone up to the feast, then he also went up, not publicly, but privately. And right here we can be thinking, oh, Jesus lied. Jesus didn't lie. He said, my time had fully not come to make like the grand entrance. Here I am, oh, ah, kind of thing, right? But yet I can go in private. I'm going to be a devout Jew because he was a devout Jew, and I'm going to go remember my father. So he goes up to the feast, but he doesn't do it in a way that his brothers thought he should. Has God ever shown up in your life unexpectedly? Because he does. God shows up unexpectedly. Sometimes we get all focused on, God, you got to work just like this, and then I'll know it's you. And we walk around with these blinders on and think, okay, if it doesn't happen this way, then it's really not of God. How about we get, let God out of the box and let God do what God wants to do, amen? How about we look for him and trust him that he's going to show up. He might not show up the way I want it. Trust me, there was many times in my life where I'm thinking, God, okay, you're going to do this. God, I followed you, and you're going to do this, and this is why I, my big expectations. Uh, and God just laughed, probably. Yeah, those are your expectations, but here's my plan, Richard. Here, here is how I'm going to really work, Richard. And that would rock my boat sometimes. And I'm sure it rocks yours as well. Well, God, if you would just work this way, I pray that you would see God showing up in a way that you didn't expect. How about that family member that you've been praying for? Maybe God's not going to use you to bring them back. Maybe God's going to use somebody else to do it. Maybe God's going to use some divine appointment and he's going to work. So don't put God in a box. Listen to the next few verses. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said, he is a good man. Others said, no, he is leading people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. What do we see from here? That sometimes his method steers up dialogue. The way he's going to move is going to get people to talk about it. And that's exactly what's happening here. They, all the Jews expected him to show up, but he doesn't do it like they expected. And they didn't, he didn't do it in the time 
that they expected. But he shows up, and we're going to get into that next week and, and his teaching at the synagogue. But some, if you look at this, some are saying he's a good man. How many of you have ever heard that today when you're talking to an unbeliever? No, I think Jesus is good. He was a great teacher. He was really into social justice. He was brought equality to everybody. He met the outcast where they were. He went to the marginalized of his. That's true. Did he not do that? But did he do way more than that? Yes. Did he claim to me way more than that? Yes. So Jesus is either Lord or he's a lunatic. He's not both. He's the Lord of, yes, I trust, I surrender, I believe, and I'm going to trust in your timing, I'm going to trust in your method, or no, you're a liar, and I shouldn't trust you. And then that's what some of the other ones have saying. No, he's leading people astray. My question to you is, when God is not working in your timetable or working in the way you want, who do you say he is? Who do you think he is? Because that is what determines, will I continue to trust and follow him? I want to play a song. I won't play it. Video will play it. The internet will play it, whatever. In this song, I don't want you to get caught up in a couple phrases or a couple words. So I'm going to give you some heads up. The name of this song is called Prophesy Your Promise. Some of you are already thinking, prophesy, uh-oh, what's going on? Richard, you know, we were founded as a Baptist church. It's not that. Prophecy strictly means in Scripture, I'm claiming and believing in God's truth and proclaiming his truths. Prophesying your promise. That's one. That's the title. Then it's going to say a couple things that says, fear can go to hell and shame can go there too. And you might be thinking, what is he talking about or what are they singing about? What are the two emotions that mankind felt when they disobeyed and they ate of the tree? Fear? Oh my gosh. God is coming, we need to hide, and shame. We're naked, we better go get some clothes on. Then the song says, fear can go to hell, shame can go there too, for I know who I am and who I belong to, something like that. It's our identity, it's speaking about our identity. So don't get caught up in these phrases, but I want to play this song. Go ahead and play this song.
So here's the thing. Some of us might be in that process, in that time, in that place where, man, I wish something would happen. I wish something would change. God, give me hope. And I pray that you would look to his promises, that you would look to continue to trust him during the process. Why? Because he's faithful. Because he's true. He cannot lie. His covenant with us does not depend upon our faithfulness. It depends solely on his faithfulness to us. So whatever process, whatever season you see yourself in, continue to trust. And continue to know that Jesus and God, they work on a divine time frame. And God's got a plan for you and for your loved ones and for the things you're struggling with. All right? God is faithful. Let's pray. Father, I, I thank you. I thank you for your incredible love and your inc incredible grace. And Lord, as we walk through 
some difficult seasons sometimes in our lives, I pray that we would see you, that we would speak of your truths, knowing that, Lord, even as you are faithful to complete the process, and we thank you for that. Lord, I pray that you are ministering to each heart here. If they are going through a great season, then praise God. And may they continue to see you in that. And Lord, if they are struggling, if we're struggling with a season in our lives of, God, why don't you just show up the way I want you to show up? Help us to trust. Help us to surrender knowing that you are Lord and that you are faithful. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you guys. We'll see you next Sunday.